C'est la même argenterie. <rire> Parce que ça, je les ai nettoyés, ceux-là. <rire> Bonjour. Bonjour, Laurent. Thank you very much for It's joining us for our latest episode of Tea for Two. So you actually used to work here. Live right? here. You used to live here. I worked and lived here, yes, for wow. two years. Wow. I was just coming out of the um, École Hôtelière in France. Uh, I did uh, two years of catering school. And um, as my very first job, I came here as a, we used to call it footman, okay. uh, looking after the ambassador from breakfast till dinner. Uh, looking after these rooms, cleaning these rooms, uh, yeah. after all the reception rooms. Yeah. Serving tea. Uh, serving tea and yeah. coffee, yes, indeed. And um, yes, serving lunch, dinner, and doing all the receptions and looking after this place, basically. And it's, it's very, um, it's quite strong for me to come back here because uh, I was, you know, I just left my parents and my first job outside my, uh, you know, st student life. I come to London. So I discover London and then I'm in the French embassy, so I've got the best of both. Can you remember who the ambassador was? Oh, for sure, yes. I had uh, Emmanuel de Marjorie first, okay. who um, his wife used to call Bobby all the time. And my actually the little anecdotes, the first day I got here, they had a lovely dog and then um, Madame just comes out of her bedroom and she goes, Bobby, Bobby, and I thought she was calling the dog. So it was my first day, the first hour, so I'm trying to be really nice. So I woke out and I said, no, Madame, I haven't seen the dog. And she goes, no, I'm actually looking for my husband. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, <laughs> this is starting really bad. But they were beautiful people. I have such good memories of them. And I still have a picture of them at home, you know, and I treasure it because they were wonderful people. But then when, while you were in London, uh, you became uh, drawn to the music scene, which perhaps was your first love. I was into music before I came here. It's funny because the first time I met Madame de Marjorie was in Paris. I went to, to meet her. I was still um, working at the, uh, not working, I was uh, studying. And um, She looked at me and I, I was like with a split jeans and you know, I had my look of the time and she looked at me like that and I thought, I'm never gonna get the job. And she said, you know, in London, there's a lot of punks. I'm like, <laughs> what? And she says, yeah, there's a lot of punks. I think you'll feel very good at home there. And this is how she said yes to me. So I came here and I knew I was gonna, you know, live London the full time, the full thing. So the great thing is, even though we were waking you know, up early here and stuff. I had London just here. So I was, co I was going out every night and living here was wonderful because all my wage was just going into music clubs, buying records. It was just for music. So I knew I was going to get all this. And was it around that time that you began DJing in clubs? No, I mean, I, I wanted to, to be a DJ since I'm 12, 13 years old. I mean, I already had decks and a mixer and I actually came with everything here in my bags. Um, I had, I wanted to be a DJ, but my job was a waiter. So it's only in 1987 when I started DJing professionally. But before I was just, you know, making tapes for my friends. I was spending all my spare time mixing. So it was like my real passion. Um, but being here, there were so many great DJs and so many great clubs back then. I just, I was just going out and taking it all in. And it's when I moved to Manchester, when I started to um, get connection in the scene. And this is how I kind of met the right people at the right time, gave them tapes and, and I became a DJ. I mean, there was no doubt for me since I'm very young that I was going to become somehow somebody who would make people dance, but I never thought I was going to have this parcours. Obviously, you arrive in Manchester. It's the late 80s. I live London in late 1985. I got offered a very good job in Manchester to look after a restaurant, so I went. And I did that for like two and a half years and I got called by the army. So I had just as I start DJing, as, as I do something in, in my biggest dream, the army comes in and 
bang, you I have to go back to first. At, at a venue which for an English person, the Hacienda is what is oh, you know. the, the <laughs> yes. most iconic uh, It nightclub. was. Oh, in Manchester, for sure. In Manchester, it was an amazing place. And yes, my very first, I'm very lucky. You know, starting starting my job here in the French Embassy and then starting my DJ career in one of the best club around the world. It, it yeah. was, I was very lucky. Yeah, I mean, you had bands uh, playing there. You had people like Madonna, the Smiths, who, who yeah, played and, in these clubs. Well, yeah, and, and it was um, it was owned by uh, one of the members from um, uh, New Order. Yeah. And we were seeing them all the time. They were there, they were in the club all the time. So we kind of, you know, met them. I met them straight away. Yeah. So it was very exciting and again it was the moment where the music scene completely changed. I kind of saw the change over, you know, from the music that was played before in clubs and what became the house and techno scene and what we're listening to today. Sure. And then you moved as you said you you went back to France for your military. Service. I did for one year, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then you Went back to Manchester. But the funny thing is, I was still DJing when I was at the army. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't sleep very much, <laughs> but um, I did six six weeks in Montlhéry in the Regiment du Marche du Tchad, and then after that, I had a job straight away in the uh, l'officier uh, le Messe des officiers in Versailles. And of course, I was staying there, I was sleeping there, and then I was going out every night. So. As I DJed in Manchester in the Hacienda, the Hacienda was already known in Paris, I kind of got jobs in Paris in clubs as well. And because I lived the explosion of house music and the beginning of techno music, I brought it back to France. And I was, you know, uh, I was the little Frenchman coming from England. So it was quite kind of exciting for people in, in France who was discovering this music. And then as soon as I finished the army, straight back to Manchester for six months, and then um, I kind of felt that I, I missed the train. Because when I left, you have to understand, I leave England in June or July 88, when the whole thing explodes, when the scene changes completely, and then when the whole of England is going into a new scene of music. They call it the sum summer of love. The summer of love, exactly. And then everybody switched from whatever they were listening to, to you know, to a house and, and whatever music that was played back then. But I lived that uh, in France through magazines and we didn't have internet and stuff like that. So it was very difficult to get the real idea, the real picture of what, what was happening in England. And when I come back, I feel like it all exploded and I missed the train. And after like six months when I came back, I thought, you know what, I'm... I'm only going to be the, the, the French guy who, who left during the good times and came back. And I thought, this is not a good position for me. I'd rather go back home. And as nothing really happened yet in France back then, I thought I'd rather do it in France. So talk to me about how it's changed today compared to back then in France. Well, it's changed because now the music is, that music is played everywhere and we don't have to fight for it anymore. I mean, it was very, very hard. I guess like the beginning of rock and roll, like the beginning of jazz or, or even, you know, even before that, uh, every new movement has detractors and people are very violent and the press were very violent against it. It was very tough at the beginning, especially in France. And, you know, now it's, it's everywhere and we, we travel all around the world, uh, we, we sell records, we, we fill uh, rooms, and you know, we, we, are, we became artists, where at the beginning, it was not seen like that at all. Do you want some tea? Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> some tea, yeah. Do you have it with milk? Uh, I do, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, no it should be me doing this, but uh, well, it, there you it go. came naturally to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Thank you very much. You also take milk. I, see. I do. Old habits die hard. I'm, I'm married to an English girl. Uh, there you go. Okay, makes sense. There you go. Couldn't get away from it. <laughs> mm, it's very good. I've heard you say before that, that you really feel that France uh, is the, the place. Um, Nowadays. Right yes, it was very difficult at first. Paris was very creative at the beginning of the 90s. 
they were discovering this music. A lot of clubs, a lot of places were vibrant regarding that music. And then it kind of all died out completely um, because the focus was less on music, it was more on personalities. Mm. And for me, this doesn't work. You know, it's a, it's a music scene and we have to always focus on the music. And then in the last, yeah, six, seven years, a new generation came and thought, we want to go against this image thing and we want to come back to the, the real roots of what it's all about, which is the quality of the music. And this is when new places opened in France. Uh, it kind of brought new kids um, it excited a lot of people, and then and then the the scene re reborn again completely, and then now for the last yeah six seven years it's been amazing, absolutely amazing. And playing in France now is always my my favorite place. Do you have any particular venues, or you, know, you were at the Rex Club? I mean, the Rex is my house. I've been, I've been kind of starting there, but there's a lot of. Um, Places which are, you know, opening for like three or four months at the moment. There's a lot of young blood, and this is what we need. And a lot of people um, mixing things together, creating. It's becoming very, very creative. Yeah, it's which a is good really place good. To be for well, France is all, France has always been quite creative mm. in music, in painting, in poetry, in a lot of stuff. And it's true. At one point in music, it was boring, and then now, even in if if you follow the the, the French rock scene. Uh, or even the French rap scene, it became again very exciting. I, I don't know what happened, but something happened. Yeah. Maybe they have more things to say now, I don't know. I just wondered what you made of the way that we consume music nowadays, which has changed. I think the big difference now, and I can see that with my son, the, the two or three big difference with him and maybe who I was at his age. Nowadays, I feel like they don't listen to music, they consume it more. I remember as a kid, uh, it took me an hour and a half to get to Les Champs-Élysées to go to Chandisk, which was a very iconic uh, record shop in Paris. And when you were going to Chandisk, a record was about 120 francs to 180 francs, which is a lot of money for somebody who's 16 years old. And when you were buying that during, my, during the, the, the way back to my house, which was quite far away, I spent I remember spending an hour reading every single word on the sleeve and mm. I cared a lot about, about what I bought and it had a, a very strong meaning because, because there was money involved with it. When I listen to music with my son, he switches from one track to another very quickly and sometimes he doesn't listen to the end. He goes, oh, here's the hook, here's, the, here's this, and, and I go, do you listen to the track the whole way together? And, yeah. and they don't, they don't have that. And the second thing, which I found very, very strange, is they don't have the concept of sound. When I was a kid, we were going to each other's house, you know, because, because he had a great sound system and we could listen to, sit down and listen to music on a really good sound system. And I see that the, uh, generation, the younger generation, they don't have that. So for Christmas, I insisted on buying a proper sound system to my son. So I bought him a nice amplifier and two really good speakers. And I said, now you sit down, you play your favorite music, and you will see the difference. And it's funny because within two weeks since Christmas, he's listening to music a bit differently. It's an education to listen to music on proper speakers. Yeah. Really, really. And to, to listen to an album from the beginning till the end because there's a story there. And it's something that I kind of learned because it was, it was like that before. And... Again, records were expensive, so you were not seeing records the same way as they do now. We talked about your, the influence that the UK had on you in the start of your career. What's the thing that you take uh, as a lasting uh, influence or, uh, on your life and career from the time that you spent in the UK? I don't know. I came here, I wasn't expecting anything, and, and then again, I had the best of both worlds. Here, what I liked here was a structure. It's something I always kept, uh, la préséance. Uh, there's a lot of things you learn in catering in general, but even more here, because here is even you know, more important. And it's something, the values that I kept all my life, I think, I think, really. Um, and then against that, in the UK, British people are 
pretty rock and roll. They're a bit crazy, and they, 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 they you know, they go, they, they live their life quite crazily, and they, they're really good fun. I guess this is why I married an English yeah. girl. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I like, I like contrast, and. Living here in London at the time where there was punk clubs, there was uh, a new wave clubs. I was going to to, ni to to 60s nights and rockabilly nights and disco nights, and and then living here during the day and having served the Queen, having served a lot of French presidents, it really it really uh, kind of brought me into uh, different levels where I learned from all from everywhere. That's great, and I, think I that's guess a perfect place to end. I up. hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.